I'd love to have met him in like a pub where, you know, like he's just an old boy in a pub at the end. I'd be like, you're right, what's your story then? Welcome to the Bible in One Year podcast brought to you by Two Brits and a Bible. Today's 58 and we're going to be covering Deuteronomy 1 and 2. In Deuteronomy 1, Moses recounts the history of Israel, defeat of the Amorites, appointed leaders, the 12 spies, and the fear of entering the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 2, Moses recounts the history of Israel some more, the passing of children of Esau, the passing through Kadesh Barnea and Moab, and the defeat of Sion, king of Heshbon. I'm going to be honest, I did not think that I was going to be able to get through Kadesh Barnea and Heshbon and Sihon with a straight face and perfectly through. You've done very well. You tried to throw me off before we hit record just to uh, yes. grin at <laughs> Definitely. So, let, yeah, little behind the scenes for listeners and watchers. I do a like three, two, one countdown, or sometimes Adam does it, but I'll, I'll sometimes do funny voices or change the volume just to make him smile before starts record it well before we start recording, yeah so. they would have seen it on the days that we were both in bucks they would have seen it because i think that was one of the teasers i started a countdown i was like we're both here there's no point in having it <laughs> like simultaneously hitting record or whatever it is so yeah 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 you you've ruined my pirate voice as well at the start but i'll let that slide oh i'm sorry ah, it's fine i'll get over it I'll, I'll sneak it in there again later still got plenty of days to go um Right, Deuteronomy. I honestly, if you are feeling like you can't be asked to read big chunks of boring passages of the Bible, Deuteronomy is a pretty good book for you because it basically just summarizes everything from Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus, doesn't it? Exodus, Numbers, like, yeah. So it's a good book. And I enjoy reading it after I've just read everything because there are things like, oh, yeah, of course. And oh, that's where that timing was. So I suggest doing all of it. But if you're hard pressed for time, read Deuteronomy. It's pretty decent. Plus, yeah. we plugged a few times the Bible Project uh, reading plan that we're doing. The videos they've got, I know I've mentioned it before, they are just so good because at the beginning of each book, they do a little video that just summarizes what is going to go on in this book in a way that makes it visual, makes it relatable. Friggin' fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more with anything you just said. Now let's actually. Uh go into Deuteronomy 1. Um, so do not show partiality in judging, hear both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone for judgment belongs to God. Um, Deuteronomy 1, Deuteronomy 1 17. I just thought that was excellent moral advice, but also it's this idea that nothing, we've said this before, obviously, nothing is too small or big for our, our God. And also in any of this, he just wants perfect justice to be enacted. You know? And that partiality that we often might want to give to say someone with more power and influence because of their power and influence is of no concern of God. God just wants justice no matter who it is yeah. to. Um, so yeah, there you go. Good kickstart for Deuteronomy. Yeah. It's, and it's just this whole, God cares about the little guy, right? Um, one of the notes that I took in there was um, presumably they, you know, don't take bribes as part of showing impartiality and stuff and actually didn't mm. realize as we were just reading back through this, that later on in Deuteronomy, there are some very specific verses about bribes and not accepting bribes. So it's just great the way that sort of came together, but yeah, allowing the little guy to have a say, I think the judicial system in general favors the big, the money spinners, you know, and so allowing that voice for the little guy is cool. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Um, so then I, speaking of justice and so on, so no one from this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. So uh, Deuteronomy 1, 35 and 36. And it was Caleb and also Joshua that believed that they were going to beat the, what, who was it? The Amorites, right? Yeah. right? Um, even though all the others thought, no, the Nephilim, the giants, they're too big, we can't do it. And so their faith has rewarded them to see the land and no one else can. Yeah. And that's justice. That's absolutely fair. I mean, God says repeatedly, just come on, I'm a pillar of fire, I'm a pillar of cloud. Right. I, I, I did so much for you. Like, come on, yeah. just believe. Yeah. And that sort of summarized for me 
in 121, where God is saying, see the Lord, your God has given you the land, go up, take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors told you, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. And so they do that, they send the spies out, but God's saying, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Uh, the irony is then um, they sent the spies in, the spies came back, 10 out of 12 of them are like, now nah, these guys are too big, we can't do it, it's not worth it, we appeared like grasshoppers in our own eyes, saying to them, all that kind of cliche stuff. Then they, right. then they try to take it, but under their own strength. And I was, again, listening to a podcast the other day by this Chris Christensen dude, who was basically saying the 10 out of 12 were correct. They were too weak. The others were too big and too strong. They couldn't take this under their own strength. And that's the huge difference, right? Doing stuff under right. your own strength as opposed to letting God take over and do it. That's where the right. difference comes in. Yeah, and that's a note that I made as well, Deuteronomy 143. I told you, but you would not listen. You rebelled against the Lord's commands, and in your arrogance, you marched up into the hill country. Yeah. So they did it on their timing. They thought that they could do it. That, and then I think also what was implied is that they sort of at that point were like, oh, yeah, all right, we'll believe in God then. Let's just go and do it. And he'll, he'll sort, you know, he'll cover it. Yeah, it's a little later on where they go to battle with or without the Ark of the Covenant, and that. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, yeah. God's timing is perfect. It's very important. Um, and then I've only got one other note for today, honestly, which is uh, do not provoke them to war, for I will not give you any off-site land, not even enough to put your foot on. I have given Esau the hill country. And that's Deuteronomy 2, 5. Yep. And that just, to me, illustrated God's faithfulness. I mean, there are so many times we've seen illustrations of God's faithfulness. Here again, this is Esau's land. It reminds us of what genesis right yeah. Esau is in genesis and and yet you know obviously god will remain faithful always in his promises uh even when we don't take up our part of the bargain exactly so, yeah and like one thing that i love in that if you remember it was esau who sold his birthright to his younger brother and so despite losing his birthright, despite all these things, you know, it's still showing that God is good and God is faithful because they still have land. They still have descendants this many, you know, say, uh, decades, potentially centuries down the road, which is just really cool. Um, yeah. And God, what God has blessed, no man can, you know, undo effectively in it. Um, exactly. I'm going to nip back briefly uh, because I found it quite interesting in Deuteronomy 1 37 it's Moses saying because of you the Lord became angry with me also and said you shan't enter it either this was after he struck the rock for the second time rather than speaking to the rock to get water out of it and just found it interesting the way Moses has kind of spun this very Adam and Eve style to be like oh it's because <laughs> of you that this happened and it's like mate take a bit of ownership bro you're old enough and wise enough by now to realize it ain't gonna fly but whatever yeah. Yeah, and he's got fabulous hamstrings still. So does he? He's got to be. Yeah. He's got to be kicking up there in age. But they've got to be withering away at this point. Yeah. In fact, um, speaking of the passing of time, it was uh, uh, Deuteronomy two fourteen, where it's actually saying thirty eight years have passed since the time we left Kadesh and Barnea until we crossed the Zered Bat Valley. So it was at least thirty eight years, and we know that Moses was old at the very beginning of this. So he's he's proper kicking on in years. Yeah, I'm just looking up how old was Moses when he died, and it says he was 120, which honestly, I'm surprised it's that young. I, I mean, think about how much he's gone through in his life. He has, he's, he's seen a lot, man. He's been around. I'd love to have met him in like a pub where, you know, like he's just an old boy in a pub at the end. I'd be like, you're right. What's your story then? He's <laughs> like, you know, you don't even want to know, man. Like, I killed a guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, you know, I imagine with a big wizened grey beard. Yeah, exactly. Um, and a radiant face, obviously. Yeah. No, I just picked up the um, Apologetics Bible and it just said randomly in 1 verse 10, as the stars in the sky is not to be taken as literally, but as a hyperbole, an exaggerated comparison. The literary device emphasizes the amazing blessing of God upon the people of Israel. So there's a random little nugget in there right at the end. Anyway, love you as usual. Feel free to engage with us on social Insta at Two Brits and a Bible. And please consider liking and subscribing to help spread the word of God. 